Good morning. Bonjour. Gabi Dedang, Jishnika, Makwarudam. My English name is Jason Whitford. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of End Homelessness Winnipeg. I'm honored to be here with, with many of you colleagues and who welcome welcome you to the to this session. For us, by us. There's there's a trend, there's a movement. I want to acknowledge that we're on a beautiful Mi'kmaq territory on the east coast of Turtle Island. Today's session is, a, is an hour and a half. We'll have two presentations that will each be uh, about half an hour in duration. Presenting on behalf of the Aboriginal Coalition to End Homeless Society is Julia. Fortunately, Fran is under the weather. Hopefully she makes it here a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Kachimi Gwich, Blaine for, for the starting us off in a good way with the smudge. Such, such a beautiful aroma. And following that, we'll have the, the Wood Buffalo Society from Fort Mac, uh, a trio tag team from uh, Joanne, Corolla, and Selena. I won't take up any more of your time, so I'll turn it right over to, uh, to my colleagues here for, for their wisdom. Jimmy Witch. Bring it down a little bit. Gwe Wale Exekbug. Hello and good morning. My name is Julia O'Quinn. I'm the Director of Community Programs at the Aboriginal Coalition to End Homelessness Society. Um, still adjusting to the time change a little bit. Uh, came from Vancouver Island earlier this week, so it's still, you know, 6 or 7 a.m. there, so uh, just bear with me. Um, excited to be here with you all, share a little bit about our work. Uh, we are a nonprofit, indigenous led organization based on Vancouver Island, uh, governed by the three tribal regions um, the Coast Salish, Kwakwakiwak, and New Channel. So I'll just begin by um, providing a bit of an introduction to our organization and then get into some of the uh, culturally supportive housing programs that we offer. Here we go. Okay, so our mission, uh, to lovingly provide culturally supportive, affordable housing and services that end Aboriginal homelessness on Vancouver Island. Uh, we are based on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, uh, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, who have been really integral um, in leading, guiding, and uh, supporting this work. Our vision, our way is to care for all of our people, from the youngest to the oldest. We are all one. Some of our people living away from home are suffering, isolated, and homeless. We stand together to end homelessness. And so what you see here is, is a gathering uh, from our very beginnings when we gathered at the Esquimalt Longhouse and brought together leadership from across the island to uh, symbolically sign this drum to come together uh, to recognize the overrepresentation of Indigenous people um, in our local unhoused population uh, and begin to put our hearts and minds together uh, to do this work. Um, our purpose, so our purpose is to strengthen First Nations, Inuit, and Métis self-identity. Um, being an urban-based organization, we do uh, support and serve a very diverse range of Indigenous people, um, providing pathways to healing and recovery, facilitating reconnection to land, family, and community, and providing a sense of place, purpose, and hope. So to tell our story, I just wanna bring us back to 2016 when we first got our start. Um, at the time, it was just our executive director, uh, Fran Hunt Genucci, doing this work and um, bringing together the right people, including our elder, Auntie Glow, who you see here in the middle. And we were asked to uh, be a part of this project called the Mayor's Priority One Task Force. Uh, the purpose of this project was to support a little over 70 uh, people who were unhoused in uh, downtown Victoria who had been banned from all uh, other supportive housing programs in town. And so this was our first start. There was uh, 20 Indigenous people who were part of this cohort. And so it was really Fran, Auntie Glow, and the small team that you see here 
uh, you know, providing homemade meals, a drop-in place to access cultural supports, elder supports, and um, we've come a long way since then. I just want to play a short video that really captures the essence of what these first early years looked like uh, and some of the voices of our Indigenous street family. Indigenous people have a distinct... I'm going to see if I can get our volume up here a bit. Uh, collective experience because of contact and colonialism and the long-lasting legacy of things like residential school, um, 60s scoop, child welfare, um, Indian Act, it's had far-reaching implications that still impact people today. Uh, healing hasn't occurred in a lot of cases. Families have been separated. People have been separated from their culture, their language, their spirituality, their sense of place. I was in and out of shelters. Uh, often the shelter would be full, so. I'd often be outside, so, you know, that's where, that's where I was before, you know. It was pretty chaotic. Um, a lot of prison time, a lot of being on the streets, a lot of, uh, addiction problems between alcohol and heroin and stuff like that. Yeah, it's um, me, me and my girlfriend, we used to uh, keep trying and trying for, uh, for apartments and uh, um, we kept, there was no go. How long have you been here? About well, five or six months I've been living here. And where do you think you would be without this? I'd probably be homeless and still using drugs, still drinking and doing bad things. Often you hear of us talked about as, you know, dispossessed people. And so what's different is we have a unique history. Um, there really is somewhat of a collective consciousness that occurs. And we all have this longing and hunger and knowledge of something bigger as to who we are. Well, what makes it different is the programs that are offered to us, like we got to make drums, we got to paint on paddles, we had to, we got to get out on a canoe. Um, basically, the programs that are going are working well for me and it helps me reconnect with my heritage and because I'm an artist and I'm starting to do artwork more again. And, um, I get support from the program, yeah. So it really helps me with carry, carry on. You know. I actually started to care about what I was putting into my body. They also have um, fresh fruits and vegetables and stuff that they give you every week. They have a place for you to eat downstairs when you, if you don't have any food. Um, you have a place to sleep. They give you a brand new bed to sleep, and I've never had a brand new bed before. Well, in this program, they have, a, they have a native elder come in once or twice a week, do lots of cooking, which I quite enjoy. Just the love that she brings with her, as well as the stories that Auntie Lo has to offer. Just her presence alone 
anti law is, you know, powerful. Just the aura, the energy. Omens Numma, we are one. I work with um, people from North Island, from the Pakwala speaking people, Nuchanu, Coast Salish, we have Inuit, uh, we have Metis. So when they come here, we have created a family space. This is our family room. I, I don't shake hands in this room, I hug. And uh, I had one cohort family member finally tell me, he said, you know, Auntie Glo, when I used to come in here and you gave me a hug, he said, it made me uncomfortable. He said, because I wasn't used to that. He said, but now I like it. Elders for the Aboriginal Coalition to seek out their knowledge and see what would be the best way to touch our hearts and get us to actually listen. You know, we respect what an elder says. It's all about respect, right? So if you have, for instance, a homeless person saying, hey, what would your elders think about what you're doing right now? <laughs> like if somebody says that to me, what would your granny think? You know, it'd make you think twice about what you were doing. It just, it just feels safe and uh, supported, and um, uh, they always help out, and I help out, and yeah, I think um, the fact that I've made it this far is pretty. Pretty amazing for me, so I look forward to to getting back into my culture, to continue my drawing, I do lots of drawing and stuff. At the moment it's the heroin that keeps keeps me down, but I've been Work in the last two years to get off it. So I know what needs to be done and how to do it. So you ask what's next? Well, I think I'd like people to um, understand that we are a lifeline, but to consider statistics from a shelter in the city of Victoria, um, so patterns of shelter use, Indigenous people account for 4.8% of the total population in our area, but they make up 31% of chronic shelter users. Wrap your mind about around that because it's alarming when you also consider that Indigenous people um, are the fastest growing population in this country and the majority of, of us are under 25, not me, but, but Indigenous people are under the age of 25. What will happen in the next 25 years? There isn't housing on reserve. My community, as an, as an example, hasn't built a new house for a couple of decades. Um, it's not uh, unheard of to hear that people have been on housing wait lists in the communities for 15 years. So there are a number of things that have to happen. We want to provide that help. We want to uh, do the research. We want to pilot programs that we can then um, bring that information forward to indigenous communities, urban communities, and say evidence-based information has told us this is what we need to do. Thank friends, resilience in, in her dedication 
she's behind the scenes and I know she's probably under a microscope to see if this works, mm -hmm. but it has, it, it has, it is. Mm -hmm. Lovely masses, no cold. Your heart is strong. Yes, that's okay. what my mother said. Come from Shkola. Okay. Spirit is strong. Yes. Thank you for sharing. So that gave a little glimpse there into our humble small beginnings. <clears throat> uh, the first three years of our programming operated from this sort of small basement community space in the uh, Micadora building in Victoria and Antiglo has really been at the heart of that work and through building those relationships in, in our first three years, um, these are a few of the learnings that, that came through for us. Um, so one, that learning around uh, the experience of our women and, and the violence uh, that oftentimes leads to homelessness. So 100% um, of our Indigenous women who are part of this program were experiencing homelessness not as a result of their own behaviour, uh, but as a result of the violence of a, of a partner in their life. Um, two, you can't quantify love. I think that came through resoundingly just in the support provided by Auntie Glow. You know, there wasn't much to work with, but she brought her waffle iron from home and everything she could think of under the sun uh, to make that a warm space for everybody to gather. And then also uh, the importance of pathways to healing and recovery. So going beyond just having a roof over our head and a place to come together, but really focusing on, you know, what are those underlying reasons as Indigenous people that we experience such high levels of substance use um, and homelessness. So in addition to learning and gathering knowledge with our Indigenous Street family, we also brought together our elders um, from across Vancouver Island to come together uh, to provide guidance in this work as we got started. And these were the five directions after a couple of days of meeting and reflection and discussion uh, that came forward. Uh, so one, to provide culturally supportive housing, so something different from the models that currently existed. Two, to develop an Indigenous alcohol harm reduction program, recognizing that while the opioid crisis is ongoing, it's, it's more of a common reality for our people to be experiencing uh, chronic alcoholism. Uh, three, establish island-wide healing communities. And so this has become our, our land-based healing work, getting our, our um, we don't refer to them as clients, but rather family members, getting our family members out of the urban space, uh, out of the smog, back onto the land uh, to gather, to do ceremony, uh, just to put their feet back on the land and, and get out of the city for a little while. Four, aligning traditional with Western models of care, recognizing the strengths in, in both Western and Indigenous-led approaches, and develop a healing house in the downtown core. Um, so this is a snapshot of what our model is. It's called the dual model of housing care, and so it incorporates both of these components, uh, the importance of having culturally supportive housing, um, with elder support on site, native medicine gardens, access to cultural foods, um, and having this offered alongside decolonized harm reduction programming um, as those pathways to healing and recovery. Um, so I'm gonna introduce you now to a few of our housing programs. Uh, this is a snapshot of the Culturally Supportive House. Uh, it opened in uh, March of 2022. Uh, it offers an Indigenous alcohol harm reduction program for 14 members of the Indigenous Street family in the downtown core. Uh, so this was a pandemic response at the time and we got situated in an old uh, Girl Guides building. Uh, so we did the best we could with that space. It was a communal living program. And just this year, we've been able to transition all of the family members um, from this, it would be referred to as a you know, shelter site on paper um, into our uh, Kwam Kwam Lelum, um, culturally supportive house. 
Uh, one thing I just want to share before moving on with this program, um, you know, different to other models of care that we've seen in the city of Victoria, we don't kick people out in the morning. Um, we told the city that our, you know, our people are going to live here. Um, they're going to be here maybe permanently or for the long term. Um, really to take advantage of that daytime to do the work that we need to do to heal. And so most of our family members that moved into this program um, stayed there for the duration that it existed. So you see her right in the downtown uh, doing um, deer skinning. Um, our native plants and medicine gardens there with Jack. And just a quote from our Indigenous Alcohol Harm Reduction Residence Program. So we're actually in year three of this program um, right now, uh, developing a model and uh, we'll have some findings to share later this year. Um, the idea behind this is providing access to, you know, a stable, steady, safe supply of alcohol, um, developing care plans for the family members to, over time, um, be reducing their intake. Uh, so one of our family members uh, shared a little bit about his experience. I didn't know who I was, and I didn't have an identity, you know, so it was helpful to be around First Nations elders and staff. It made me feel some pride, I guess to get out of my other part of my different masks that I wore on the street. It was important to me, I think, to find my voice. Um, so this is the new house, House of Courage, that we transitioned into earlier this year. Uh, there are 43 units on site. Uh, it's for unhoused Indigenous people over the age of 19. Um, it, it's been really successful. Um, you know, in that process of, of bringing our family members home, of having a blend of community, different types of substance use, different age ranges, um, to really build that sense of community and care. So uh, 14 units on the, um, of this house are dedicated to that Indigenous Alcohol Harm Reduction Program. Here's a snapshot inside, some of our family members. And moving on to the beginning of our Spockin House. Um, so this is a groundbreaking ceremony that took place uh, before the house even began to be built uh, with some of the local elders. So this is just the importance of bringing together community, starting this work in a good way, um, helping to break the ground here um, and lead to the building uh, that you see here. Uh, so this is a culturally supportive house called Spockin House. It's dedicated to Indigenous women, uh, prioritizing those who are fleeing violence. We have 21 units here uh, with 22 family members housed currently. A glimpse into the therapeutic gardening. Um, so we grow lots of different things here, medicines, plants that contribute to the food program, also the cultural programming. Uh, a few more photos there. So you can see even in the span of three years, it's really grown quite a bit. Uh, we do have elder and auntie support. Um, so this was some work done with BC Housing to really recognize the importance of having elder and auntie positions as part of supportive housing programs. Um, it's been very successful. So you see Auntie Glow here, uh, you know, has helped facilitate a number of women's circles. Uh, on this particular day, we were out at Beacon Hill Park and the women all had an opportunity to be dressed in traditional regalia. Um, she shared many teachings, and it's, it's pretty powerful. Uh, for some of the women, it was their first time wearing regalia. Um, so you just see really that sense of pride that, that comes through. On the left-hand side, some medicine making there from uh, plants grew in the garden. And as an extension of the Spock and House program, uh, we have a family reunification townhouse. So this is adjacent to the property. Uh, it's a three bedroom townhouse and it's available to all of the family members in our programming. They can rent it out uh, for one day to up to one week to have visitations with their children who are in care. Uh, so, you know, a lot of women might start with a supervised day visit and over a course of time, you know, work up to six, seven day visits um, with their children. A few photos here of some of the land-based family reunification programming. And this is really what decolonized harm reduction looks like in practice. 
a lot of our family members will, will tend to reduce or abstain from their substance use in preparation to spend time with their children um, and just really instilling that, that long-term sense of purpose and hope. Uh, one of our newer initiatives, Hat Hat Palatsis Lelam, uh, translates to Sacred Cradle House. We just started this in uh, July of this past year. Uh, dedicated to pregnant and newly parenting Indigenous women who were uh, previously unhoused. Um, there's a real trend I can speak to at least locally where our, our women who are housed uh, in support of housing or who are unhoused um, oftentimes see their children go into care, uh, which then, you know, leads to those cycles of, of homelessness and continued substance use. So this is a transitional housing program that supports mom and babe um, to stabilize for a little while until we can support them find uh, longer term housing. And Auntie Glow spends a lot of time with the women uh, doing cooking classes, rebuilding some of those life skills um, in preparation for uh, full time parenting. A few photos from this program. And this is part of that, you know, loving approach um, that we aspire to. Auntie Glow has uh, handmade each of the babies in the program their own personal quilt uh, that she's gifted. Um, and we also support our family members once they are prepared to transition into independent living. So this is one of those systemic structural changes we've been able to influence locally. Um, with the city, with our CRD, um, is proportional access. So uh, Indigenous people in Victoria at our last point in time count accounted for 33% of the unhoused population. Uh, so we've been able to advocate and work with the city to say we need proportional access to subsidized housing units. And so that commitment has been made uh, to dedicate 33% of the units to Indigenous people. Um, we had our first major transition um, back in 2020, and we transitioned 14 family members who have now been housed for over two years. Uh, this provides a little bit of a snapshot of some of those communications. So we had one uh, housing transition manager who was dedicated to these family members, and this just gives a glimpse, you know, in, in the first nine months that she had supported, there was nearly 700 communications going back and forth. Uh, so it really speaks to the need to um, continue that support. Moving independently can come with a real sense of isolation. Uh, so the importance here is to continue that sense of community, continue that sense of support. Uh, we bring our family members together for holiday meals, uh, cultural programming, any opportunity that we can gather together. I'm going to fast track here because I've got a three minute warning. Um, so our decolonized harm reduction programming comes alongside our housing and as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's that opportunity to get out on the land to do that healing work that's not only physical, that's not only emotional, but spiritual as well. And so you get a little glimpse into some of that programming and, and we try at least once a year to get out to the three tribal regions so all of our family members have the opportunity to reconnect to their homelands. A quote here about land-based healing. Land-based healing is ground, uh, groundbreaking from the bottom of my feet up to my heart and into my soul. It changes my perspective in life and the energy that I carry. It helps me set a new path and be one with myself. It helps me reawaken how to be grateful again. I believe culture is healing. I don't feel negative thoughts or feelings at all. The ocean is healing and it's saying, you can do it. Uh, just a few awards here that the coalition has received in a couple of years just to you know, recognize the importance of this programming um, locally on Vancouver Island, but also across the province and across the country. Uh, so I just wanna share quickly to end us off here, um, some really important outcomes from this programming, just so you have a sense of the impact that it's had in the last few years. So this was a message that was received um, by our executive director from BC Housing and they shared, I clearly remember the first time 
you spoke about Spokken. It was still two years away from opening at that time, just as you always knew, and according to our data, the Spokken model is very uniquely successful. While I realize the data is a small piece of the story, I want to share what I found. 32 out of 33 women who have resided at Spokken have maintained housing after 20 months. 13 women from the original intake remain housed at Spokken. 11 women from the original intake have transitioned to subsidized housing, and we've had zero evictions into homelessness. I want you to know that... Um, I want you to know that this is very special and different from what we often see in larger supportive housing sites with different models of care. I don't have time for this, so I'm going to end this <laughs> off, but um, our upcoming initiatives include uh, youth housing. Uh, we're going to be expanding the Mums and Babies program to a 15-unit house in January, um, expanding across the island to kind of replicate these models for more of our uh, rural communities and looking towards the wellness house that the elders had um, given us guidance in in our early days. Okay, that's everything. Thank you. <laughs> that's amazing. That's very uplifting. I'll, I'll turn it over to our trio from uh, Wood, Wood Buffalo. I'll just take a minute to uh, upload the presentation. I think what this the presentation, the, the the message there is, and one thing that that I I've shared with uh, with um, non-indigenous government, is that abilities have always been been with our community, and through colonization those responsibilities were mo were removed. <clears throat> so, it, it's the um, our, our purpose we're we're re re refilling we're reconnecting with our with our true purpose. We'll turn it over to our, our team from Wood Buffalo. Good morning. So, Tansi, Anin. My name is Joanne Packham. I am from Fort McMurray, Alberta. I'm a transplant in Fort McMurray. I've been there for just over 17 years. I'm originally from central Manitoba, from the Thank you. From uh, the Pine Creek Duck Bay region, my family is Fletz, Richards, and Chartrands. So, I am here. <laughs> um, I am the Executive Director of Wood Buffalo Wellness Society, and I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Carola and Selena. So I'm here to talk about Tawau. <laughs> uh, let's see, where are we here? That's not working. Or maybe a... No. Okay. There we are. Yeah, that's us. That looks nothing like me. <laughs> All right. So our organization. Um, I have this up here to, so that you understand the, the scope of what we do. So um, 11 years ago, I became the executive director of Wood Buffalo Wellness Society. And at that time, we were just one small program, the Mark Amy Treatment Center, which is a NADAP treatment center in uh, just south of Fort McMurray on Fort McMurray First Nation. And we were a staff of seven at the time. So since then, we've grown. Um, and we have several programs. So this right now represents um, many of our different programs and around 72 staff. Not big compared to a lot of the people who are speaking, but it's pretty big for us. We, um, so the reason why I'm sharing this though is just to understand that we come from an addictions background, um, but we always say that we are abstinence based with the heart, of soul, heart and soul of harm reduction. Um, coming into housing really challenged me to 
to look at things differently and um, and we've certainly done that and we've embraced it. So we have, we look at harm reduction as a stage in the continuum of care um, with our programming. While our, our ultimate goal is to have someone living in sobriety, we know that not, not everybody is going to reach that or attain that. Um, so, but we, we don't leave them in a stage, in, in an introduction state of harm reduction. We try to carry them along and bring them along and largely through culture. So um, we have the Mark Amy Treatment Center. Community Services is our Housing First program. Tuao is the program that I'm speaking about now. And Sagitawin is our recovery homes. Our recovery homes are, we, we run four men's recovery homes and two women's recovery homes in the community. And then again, um, we have some cultural programming with Mark Amy as well. So timeline, Wood Buffalo Wellness Society. So we started in 2006, I'm gonna quickly, this is a, actually quite a long presentation, so I'm gonna try and skip over things. Um, we, obviously Fort McMurray is known for the oil sands. We have um, a lot of oil and gas industry, um, a basically very, very quick, introduction to oil and gas in the last 50 years approximately, 50 to 75 years. So that's that has a great influence on the community, on um, on our, our local nations, on certainly on our indigenous community as it's impacted our homeland there, very much our hunting territory, very, very much our culture. Um, so we have a history of a lot of inequity. There are some stories that are still very live and living and we're still playing this out around uh, displacement. Um, Mox and Flats is a, uh, is a situation that happened where an oil and gas company was coming in, they needed housing, and they basically, it was a, a forced displacement of a lot of uh, First Nations and Métis families along the river, um, and where land was taken, it was it was atrocious what had happened. And actually, um, Corolla, who is going to be speaking, um, Corolla's dad came up in the 70s to help with the nego negotiations of Moxon Flats with the community. So um, in the shadow of Moxon Flats is really how we were able to enter into a lot of conversations around how things needed to change. Um, so I'll just kind of skip over this. In 2012, 2013, I was the Indigenous Rep on the Homeless Initiative Strategic Committee, and that's the committee that oversees all of the community plant and homelessness programs in Fort McMurray. So at that point, um, I started to really ask, oh my goodness. <laughs> that's my former team lead. <laughs> um, for many years ago. Anyway, um, I started to really ask what was going on. Uh, how many Indigenous people were really getting served? What what was that really looking like? And I wasn't able to access that that data very easily. And actually, I was I was getting blocked. Um, so I ended up going to the ministry. I was told ministry, no, no, um, you you absolutely do have that data. After being told from our our city at the time, it's different management now, but our city at the time told me, no, we don't have that data. I knew we collected that data. So. Um, I went back to the ministry. The ministry said, you absolutely do have that data. I went back to the city and said, hey, city, the ministry says we, you have that data. And they said, no, we don't own that data. You need to go to, you need to, go to the individual agencies. So I went to the individual agencies and I said, can you share, me, share with me your, indiv your indigenous data? And they said, no, we can't. No, we can't. And then when I went to the final agency, they said, hey, Joanne, just letting you know that we got a call from the city before telling us to tell you that you couldn't have the data. So we went back, I went back at that point and I FOIPed it with the province. The province then shared the data and it was unbelievable. So uh, back then there was, uh, despite the indigenous population being 7% um, of, our, of our population in Fort McMurray is indigenous, uh, but we estimate that anywhere between 60 to 80, up to 85 uh, percent of the chronic population is. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll have to go back to that one. 60 is 60 to 85 of the chronic population is of Indigenous ancestry, and this is some of our current data right now. So um, 7 percent, 
59% of all of our clients presenting in centralized intake. We also do all of the centralized intake and assessment for Fort McMurray. So anyone who is in, at, experiencing homeless or at risk of homelessness comes through our agency and we do that screening. 91% uh, of uh, clients currently housed in, oh no, that, that is an old stat. I don't know how that made that in there. I'm actually not sure of the current stat. Um, and 73% of all clients transferred into the RMWB. Um, programs are of Indigenous ancestry. So um, back then, despite those stats, which are still fairly trending on that same level, um, only around 30% of any clients accepted into the program in those first three years were Indigenous. The first of the first three years, we only had six, six, and and one graduate in um, in one of those years. So it was pretty. Pretty crazy. So I knew something had to change. So I'm gonna go, oops, Selena. No, Selena. <laughs> Do you know how to go back? Oh yeah, there we go. Okay. This one or this one? Arrows, that one, thank you. Beauty. All right, so. Um, Many moons ago, about eight years ago, I shared um, last. I shared a article on Facebook. I had gone to a CAH conference in Vancouver back then, and um, I learned about some Indigenous housing programs, one in BC. And back then, I remember learning about Ambrose Place, and that was out of Edmonton. I didn't know Corolla at the time, and I shared on Facebook we need something like this within our community. And lo and behold, about a year and a half ago, I'm sitting in Neganin's ceremony room doing a tour of Ambrose Place and I'm scrolling through memories and that came up on that day. So what you put out to the universe, just like, <laughs> just like what she was talking about this morning comes true. So here we are. Um, so, Ambrose Place started about 10 years ago now, actually. So again, old slide. In 2016, we had a little situation in Fort McMurray that was that we just call the fire. Everything in Fort McMurray now is, is measured against before the fire and after the fire. So before the fire, we tried desperately to get some of our clients into Ambrose Place um, that we just were struggling and ab at an absolute loss for. So at the time, there was a two-year uh, two wait list, and then the fire happened, and uh, Corolla and her crew were very gracious, and they accepted one of our clients. And that's where we really started to actually get to know about this program. So four years ago, in the treatment program, I met uh, Dr. Cunningham as an elder, and she started coming into our into our treatment center as an elder, running our women's lodges, doing teachings, that kind of thing, and I developed a relationship with her. So when, uh, about a year and a half ago, a year and a half into this project, because this project has been my life for three years, I had approached her and I said, hey, can I, can I learn from you? you? You are the guru. You are, <laughs> you are the person that I really want to be learning from. Uh, so we started with a tour of Ambrose Place. We brought our then partners at the time, some of our other community partners down, and we did a tour. And we really started to look at that model and how we could apply that into our community. So it was a very natural partnership because I already had so much respect for Neganen and so much respect for Dr. Cunningham, um, well, Corolla. And then um, a year ago, she retired and we were able to start working together in a different in a different capacity um, as, a, as not only our mentor and not only um, working as a consultant, but certainly um, a, a little bit more present and uh, yeah. So, so uh, a year and a half ago, we took our elders advisory circle down to Edmonton and we started in ceremony. We had a pipe ceremony to start off in a good way. Um, and we know that when you start out in ceremony, um, all things come together as they're meant to. <laughs> I have to remind myself that of all the time because sometimes that doesn't really feel like that and, and we'll get into some lessons learned as I go. Um, but we are very, very grateful to Neganen. Uh, Neganen is in the front row here. Um, to Carrie and her crew. Um, and to Corolla, the former CEO as well. Um, so the, the, the partnership with, with Nikonen is simply 
just beautiful. I, I really look at it. It's been a natural partnership, uh, one, of, one of mentorship, but also one of more than that. And kind of going back to the old ways where communities help communities, it's been one of friendship and one of reciprocity and generosity. They've sent staff up. We've sent staff down to do training with them. They've came, when we opened, they sent a, a crew of three up when we opened our temporary program. Um, and they've really helped us with like a lot of our policies and procedures and just lessons learned. So it's been beautiful. Um, and, and just really understanding, like I said, with that reciprocity and natural law. So, and I will say that Neganen has very much invested in us and we feel it. So. Okay, so I'll just skip over a lot of this, but this is our uh, case management model. If some of you are familiar, this is, I'm, I'm a, I started out my career in child and youth care, and this is Dr. Um, Dr. Martin Brokenleg's Circle of Courage. So he put together this circle of courage or this medicine wheel um, around working with youth. But it very much has always resonated with me that these are the four aspects of what we need to, to build a strong human. So this is what we need to give to youth. And if we're thinking of our clients as well, that they've experienced so much trauma in their childhood, typically, um, and I would argue most definitely, um, that there is a there's a part of them that is stuck there that's halted there in in that and really if we're if we're looking at kind of going back and and trying to bring those building blocks back together we need these four aspects so we built our a lot of our case management around that um, and then our core values so so Tawau actually I'm just okay, I'm skipping back to that Tawau in translation is a Cree word for welcome come in their space for you. So that was selected by one of our elders, um, and it's very, very fitting. Um, we also base this off of our, our, our agency's seven traditional teachings are our core values, the seven, um, and then Omantiao teachings. So Omantiao is, is a, is a, it's a four-day teaching, actually, that we, we work with, with another group of our mentors. Um, and it's four days of ceremony, and it's really teaching allyship, and um, the, it's, it's based on the teaching that we give our guests our very best. So when our clients come into any of our programs, you will see um, that it's not institutional. I very much value having a, a beautiful space, a nice space. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, our, uh, especially our women, um, come in and say, you know, I've never had my own bed. I've never had my own room. I've never had anything pink. Um, so the male spaces are, are decorated male. The female spaces are decorated very female. And um, I really pride myself on that. I'm, I am a grown little girl who remembers visiting her dad in treatment. So I, I understand the importance and the value of, of investing into persons at that at where they're at in their most vulnerable state, and really making them feel loved and valued. So, um, and then we also really wanted to look at what were the key aspects of community. So, when you're building a community, when you're building a family, what 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 are those key aspects? And multi generational, having children in the space, having elders in the space, cookums, mushums, aunties, uncles. Um, that's very important. I spoke a little bit about um, about harm reduction, and then once again, everything that we do is based in uh, is, is based in culture. Um, the importance of language, the importance of our traditional foods, the importance of being able to access elders and traditional medicines and ceremony, um, getting out on the land. I know that for me, the that when I am the most stressed the absolute most stressed and I want to really just step outside of that and lose myself. Um, I want to go work on hides. I want to go with my elders and I want to spend a day or two out on the land and I want to be making dry meat or, or, making, or, or working on hides because that's how I feel most connected to my grandma, to my Coco, and that's, that's how, how I feel how I understand why I'm here on this earth and what I need to do because they speak through me. So, I think this is a little bit about where I should hand this over to you and talk about the partnership, talk about to wow what that's going to look like and bringing you on board. 
okay, she's not bringing me on board. <laughs> no, bringing on board for this. <laughs> yeah, it, it's great to be here. I uh, want to say tanse toya miogizika ogishiko squeos netsika san ochima wapoeg. And I'm really happy to be here and being hosted by my brothers and sisters from the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq and the Maliti and the, there's a whole bunch of other ones, but I'm forgetting them. But I, I'm grateful to be here. It's a beautiful land and the, it's a beautiful harbor and it makes me feel really wonderful to be here. Um, and I really appreciate the presentation before because Fran Knutchen is another one of my mentees and had come and learned a lot when we um, were opening all of our places at Niganan, Ambrose Place, Pimatsuan, um, Omamu Wangu Gamek, gee, just about forget that one and I make everybody <laughs> say the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, they got uh, MacArthur online now, and there's more to come for sure with Nick and Ann. But what we learned, what I learned through that, I pass on as much as I can because it is our way. We're here to share, and there isn't a province in Canada that doesn't deserve multiple housings that are Aboriginal led, Aboriginal run, and centered on ceremony, land, language and relationship. And if you're not doing that, you need to get after your provincial and municipal government and demand it. So that's what we're doing in Fort McMurray. We're demanding <laughs> that the municipal government and provincial government uh, step up to the plate and house this uh, 29 room facility that can be expanded up to 45 beds. And we've taken all of the things that we developed at Niganan and put it into one building. And so each one of our buildings at Niganan were always about building community. And so we always looked at co-ed, age groups, and tried to do all of those things. In this one, it's really <laughs> even moving further because uh, the top floor is families, women fleeing <laughs> domestic violence. They're totally secure in their units. And then beneath them is hardest to house people that are coming in from encampments and off the street. And then two detox beds, which is really important and something that I know Niganan's working on through their new build. And uh, it, it just, so many of our people when they try to go into detox are kicked out <laughs> because they have too many mobility issues or too many men mental health issues and uh, detox doesn't want to deal with them. So have detox on site, they move from detox right into housing. And that's the whole concept behind this. The beauty of Tawau is that, and, the, and this is what I've learned over my years, and I'm 70 years old, so I've learned that when you support people with purpose, with love, with good food, with good relationship, they start to grow. And they start to make good personal choices on their own. So you can have somebody that's chronically, chronically addicted that if they've been housed with us for a period of eight years, may move, which is blew my mind, into social housing on their own in, in a sober way. Some not so lucky, some will stay with us forever, but at least they're managed they're safe, they're secure, and they have choices to be sober one day, two weeks, one month, and have relapses. But at least they're safe and they're loved. And um, that's the whole concept of getting our people housed. This is a real big step in us decolonizing and reclaiming our people. Um, the whole concept of being able to bring families in, and Omamu Wangugamik has proved that, hands down, that if you give a pregnant woman a chance, she prospers and she raises her child. 
Because, I mean, I mean, the 15 women that have had children at Umamu were all red flagged to lose their children. They're now with their natural parents, and they're growing and bringing children back in out of the system. My vision would be that, you know, we would no longer need Ambrose places because we do really good work at the front end. So... That's what this is about. This is what you're doing for your communities. If you're, if you're interested in housing your people, you're helping save our nations. You're bringing back who we belong and how we walk here on Turtle Island. So. I, will, I will say, um, so in August, we, ha we had a, a situation in Fort McMurray where encampments blew up over the summer and uh, our agency was called in to be a part of that solution and we actually opened up a temporary towel in a separate in a in a in a temporary location in another hotel while we waited on occupancy we are set actually to open to well next week um, kind of uh, it looks like yesterday that that got bumped a little bit but um, uh, we definitely will be opening those doors in the next few weeks to a month um, but what happened, actually, in, in, within the last week, we've had two businesses reach out to us and say, hey, we notice a stark difference in the amount of crime in the downtown area. We're no longer seeing as much break-ins. We're no longer seeing as much um, stealing. And we think that that's directly related to your program. So that's a huge success for us because we're already seeing those difference, the, that, that impact in the community and our community is embracing us. The other really, really cool thing that I that we do within our programs, and part of why I wanted to share that org chart is to show that interconnectedness between those programs, because my absolute favorite piece is that we get to have our clients go through, transition through, again, that continuum of care, and they come back and they work for us. Mm -hmm. So right now, we have uh, four of our clients that have transitioned through our addictions programs and our homeless programs. Um, that work full-time for us in different capacities. We just applied for a large grant for an employment program to be able to employ our, um, our, our women in our kitchens um, and in labor positions within the Tawel program and some of our other programs because what we've heard resoundingly from those clients is that being connected to us, seeing us even if it's 20 hours a week, um, but checking in with us um, and just that presence and being a part of our community still in our family, not just as a client but as a peer, has kept them has kept them sober. Um, so it's that that absolutely. And we have women who have been uh, missing uh, missing women. They can't get jobs anywhere else because as soon as as soon as they apply for a job, they're Googled and they're and. The, the employers, potential employers, see that they've been missing, you know, two, three times, and but they're they they are invaluable in our in our program, and it's just it's wonderful. So, um, it works. What we do works, and what we do saves lives. And that holistic wraparound approach um, involving others is really important. So that's our service delivery model. Wrap around, 24 hour, nurses on site. Uh, we're going to have two detox beds. We don't have medical detox in our community. We are a small city of 76,000. That's why we had to combine all of these different settings into one setting to kind of make this up. Um, we purchased uh, an old hotel. That hotel is 25 years old. It's 25 years old. This is where we are now. Um, so we purchased the building. We did a community engagement last year, last, last spring, summer. We, did, we actually started last fall. We've done six community engagement sessions in all. Um, we opened our temporary bridge program in August. We're really working on permits and occupancy and, um, and funding and program development and um, trying, trying to stay sane. Um, so this is the hotel on the one side, and then this is the concept drawing. So how do we get from there to there? Um, and th these are just some of our major, major lessons learned. So arm yourself with data. D data is so your friend. 
get data from everywhere, FOIP the data if you need to, really look at those trends. Um, I've been uh, drowning in proposals lately, so really looking at data. And there's some really interesting things around how the Indigenous experience of homelessness actually translates in our community into data. Uh, last week I was pulling some data and I learned, I really saw that um, Indigenous persons as a whole tend to come for screening to either our agency, which is the centralized intake, but we have a community access program in, in our community access in, in our community where there, I believe there's 13 entry points. Um, but largely, if you're Indigenous, you are coming to either our agency or to an Alberta Health Services agency for that. So you're skipping around the shelters. Interesting. What does that say? Um, and again, I think that it's a, it tells the story of how their experience is in our community. So surround yourself with mentors and elders, um, people that you, you can go back to and say, hey, how did you do this? But hey, also, I don't know that I can do this. And like, what have I signed up for? Like those days, because those days happen. Um, you need to have people who have walked that road before you. Uh, do your due diligence, investigate if you are entering into a property investigate, 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 um, because wow, those things can really um, throw monkey wrenches into your plans when you have to do a new roof that you didn't think was going to happen. Um, if you are in your, in your city, involve your city in planning and development and safety right from the get-go so that they are on board, they know what you're doing, and that they don't throw monkey wrenches in, you know, at the 95% because <laughs> that happens to get ahead of NIMBY with help. And so you can't hide from NIMBY. I was, la, 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 this is so needed in our community. It's just going to be cool. It's going to be good. And then all, and it was cool and good until it wasn't cool and good anymore. <laughs> and we had um, all of a sudden businesses that were really, really concerned about us moving in to be their neighbor. Um, and I didn't do a great job of uh, doing that community engagement in the beginning because we were so busy just doing the work. So when I say with help, right off the start, find money to work with a marketing firm <laughs> to be to to work with you to be able to do a communications plan and to be to be planning those things like community engagement sessions and press releases and things like that. We're social workers. I'm, are you guys great at press releases? Because I'm not. Um, so that's that's a big thing. Um, build allies very much in the community. Educate. So we have the benefit of, of already being kind of that ally builder in the community. We are the agency that hosts ceremony. So we host the sweat lodges. We host a lot of the professional development around Indigenous um, teachings and allyship in our community, and we have for about the last decade. So we've already done a lot of work on building allies, but so in the non-Indigenous community, but certainly within within our nations and our Métis communities. Um, brace yourself for discrimination. You don't think that stuff happens anymore, but holy smokes, does it ever. And um, I, I consider myself to be a pretty tough cookie, but some of this stuff has, has absolutely rocked me. Um, going through a, a NIMBY process of a building that we were about to purchase, um, this is two years ago now, where we had we were moving along this process and the community submitted a um, opposition to our development permit. And we had to go through a hearing process with the city around that and just to see how um, persons were able to come and testify in this hearing process and the things that they were allowed to say and being permitted to say in this hearing that were just so discriminatory was, um, it still sits with me. Um, so it, I just, I cannot imagine what it's like for our clients. And don't, don't give up. So five minutes, okay. Um, <laughs> Perfect timing. So uh, I said this yesterday, but I'm going to tell you. Last night I was about to give up. Um, where there was just there was some decisions, some some communications around funding and whatnot. And yeah, don't give up. My family this morning. I wake up to text. Don't give up. So um, it's hard. It's really hard. I can't tell you guys how many tears.
but we know why we're doing it. And um, we have lost so many of our clients that we absolutely love. And they're our family, they're our brothers, our sisters, our aunties and uncles, and we're their aunties and uncles, and we're their, their nieces and nephews, and you know, and, and it's, it's uh, we know why we're doing it. And I see, I see my family in those faces. I see, I lost my, my, I lost, I've lost family members to overdose and to homelessness and um, I see them and I, I always say to my, to my staff, I want you to treat everybody like they're your aunt, auntie, uncle. Just keep that in mind. And how would you want your son to be treated in another city? How would you want your nephew, your uncle, your dad to be treated in another city? So then it is our job to treat these clients like that. So I'm going to hand this off to the lovely Selena. Hey. Um, yeah, I'm Selena. I'm currently an addictions counselor at Mark Amy Treatment Center. And I actually um, graduated just last year from McEwen University. So I was doing some research with Niganon. And, uh, you know, it's uh, beautiful networking, got me where I am, the lovely Fort McMurray. And I'm so very, very thankful for that. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yes, we're hoping to uh, embed some research into our TWOW program as well, you know, to keep arming ourselves with data, making sure that, um, you know, we're, we're measuring um, the real, real improvements that these kind of programs are going to have in our community. I'm also really interested to see how we're replicating um, Niganon's uh, with a mentorship and uh, you know um, integrating those lessons that we're learning from Niganon so that we can have a document that we can share and, and provide to other communities that are interested in um, bringing in these sorts of programs into their community, uh, seeing ways in which these programs can be adapted for those communities. Um, we're still in very early stages. I'm also just a little baby researcher, and right now it's just me, so hey, throwing it out there, we're looking for partnerships, and the universities want to come help us with our research. Um, but yeah, we just really want to see and, and be able to prove that these programs work uh, when they are Indigenous-led, when they're Indigenous-owned, when we're creating community, uh, when we're um, treating clients like family, and really building those really right relationships uh, with our Yes, and that they're cost effective. You know, we're saving the municipality, so please fund us. <laughs> um, but yes, please uh, reach out to us if you're interested in, in collaborating, and uh, we're hoping to see more programs like this across Canada, across the globe. Um, yeah, and that's really, I'll, I'll leave it at that since we're low on time here. But uh, thank you all again, and, th and thank you, um, Canadian Alliance and Homelessness, for hosting us this year. And uh, we're looking forward to the partnerships that we make here. Thanks. Great presentations. I, I think it's, a, it's an indication of uh, the, the openness and the willingness to, to share knowledge. Uh, that's, that's always been a like a practice that is embraced and done by done by our people. I, I recall sharing proposals and, and just saying, oh, I just want a piece of tobacco, a bit of tobacco, <laughs> and that, that's all I'm asking. So our our, our knowledge is, is freely provided, and as long as it'll help change the lives of, of others, that's all that's all that we hope for. Um, open it up for, for questions and answers. This is more of a conversation. And I'm, I'm going to bring the mic over there to you, and then I'll, I'll ask. Uh, there's one there over here, Melissa, and three over here. Okay, keep them coming. And we'll ask, uh, just direct who your presentation is, or your question is to, and then I'll ask the, the respondents to come up to the microphone here. My name is Tori Judd. I am Red River Métis, uh, but I live here in Chibuktuk. I am uh, part of the team um, at the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center that runs two of our residential programs. Um, and I was wondering if I could hear from the, the first presenter, sorry, I can't remember your name, um, if you could speak a little bit on how you navigate uh, harm reduction while um, also honoring like sobriety protocol and ceremony. 
Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, our programs, we really aspire to the value of nobody left behind. Um, so even in our, our land-based programming, as an example, you know, we're sometimes traveling out into our ancestral homelands that are three, four, five hours away, right? And so it's been really integral to work closely with our local health authorities. Uh, they have funded for our programs uh, dedicated nurses, so they work really closely uh, with our family members to make care plans, do that preparation work, and actually go out on the land. So if you know there are prescriptions that need to be administered, for those that are on our Indigenous alcohol harm reduction program, you know, they continue to have their hourly pours and whatever they need, you know, to support their physical health while they can also attend to um, the spiritual healing components as well. Um, you know, they're depending on who we are working with, what community, what facilitator, what elder. There are some uh, abstinence-based ceremony, uh, sweat lodge as an example, uh, we often do with, um, uh, knowledge holder, Huyampton. And so, you know, it, it might not always be um, accessible to all family members, but we do create ways where we have daily access to culture in urban spaces, um, doing those overnight land-based healing camps, um, and then, you know, those who are kind of walking their pathway to healing and recovery, connecting them uh, with that ceremonial work as well. I hope that answers your question. Hi, um, I'm Melissa, I'm from Winnipeg. I live in Winnipeg. Um, just what I've learned, we started um, tiny homes in Winnipeg. And a lot of our relatives have said that we need to change our wording from clients to our relatives or our family. So we've, um, in, we've taken their advice as another lesson learned because we use the same um, wording, uh, and we now call our, the folks that we support our relatives or our family, and we have completely taken out the word client because it's undermining and it's disempowering. Just throwing that out there. Hi, uh, my partner here and I, we work in Guelph. We are the only two Indigenous housing workers in Guelph. We have to go to the mainstream organizations to ask for money. But one thing that we were able to do, pr provide our relatives uh, is bus passes, phone plans, when they get housed, internet. This has kind of created a problem, and since you guys are, you know, miles and miles ahead of us, I don't know if you've experienced this, but we experience, especially with our, our female relatives, is the non-Indigenous men clinging on to them to get the resources that are for Indigenous people. And um, now I do know that there are some people that long-term relationships and they have children together and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the others. And how do you deal with that? Because I, we are starting to face some situations where we can't house one without the other. And in most cases, these are highly violent situations. So we just want your input. Miigwech. Um, we've had situations like that, and um, so where we've been able to house, I, I created a dog house, actually. And when we had uh, couples that would end up in fisticuffs, so to speak, um, somebody was in the dog house. And uh, then we'd work to uh, repair the relationship or mediate what was going on. And when it came to abuse, 
around finances and, and those kind of things, we were op often able to separate them and actually get to the point where the man would be removed and the woman would stay housed. And, and you, it was clear that that's what the relationship was built on. I know you don't have a housing piece to it, but that's how we did it. Uh, it's much more difficult when you're just street level to separate that. Um, but if you can get them housed and then work at separating them through that process, it often works. Thank you. Morning, everyone. So I'm Nikki Mann from Rest Centers in Brampton, Ontario. Um, very, very good work. Um, kudos to both organizations. Um, I really love the presentations and the work that you're doing. Um, you're serving a population um, like we serve as well. We serve predominantly black youth. And so much of the struggles that you face, the discrimination, everything resonates um, with our organization. And um, I don't remember who it was, but it, you spoke to the fact that a lot of your children are going into state care, even as early as birth. Has there been any research, anything around why that happens? We have had consultations with our youth, and we have gotten their perspectives on the impact of state care on them. But have either of you done any kind of research around that, and what have been the findings, and how do you move forward from that? That's one. And then secondly, I realized I do have neighbors here, persons from Guelph, but it was my second question was gonna be um, whether or not you're open to what I'm gonna say, cross-provincial supports, because even though our emphasis is on um, black youth, we do also open our services to ind indigenous population. And funny enough, last week we were discussing the fact that in really being true to those um, clients, we do not have many at this moment, but we need to be more culturally aware. So from that perspective, I wanted to know whether you were open to staff sensitization for one. Um, it's a virtual space, and I mean, we could always fly in. And um, you know, maybe helping us to reconnect, because many of our youth have been so disconnected from their cultural heritage. So those were my two long-winded questions. I'll take on the one around um, mothers. Um, the whole um, thought when Oma uh opened up was to uh, make sure that um, all these women that were red flagged to have their child apprehended had a navigator or a support system within them when they were going to give birth. And so we worked very closely with the Indigenous Birth Association. So those are Indigenous women that are taking on a doula and midwife role. So they were directly connected with them. And I know Melissa just went in with the last mother. She's here somewhere, I think, and uh, navigated that. If you don't have a navigator with women that have been red flagged, the child will be apprehended. And so you have to be really forceful and be there, be present through the entire birth and, and make sure she gets back to the housing because, uh, yeah, it's a systemic system. And if you're not there and you're not navigating and you're not supporting, the child will go. But if you're there, you can stop that from happening. So that's it. If I may, Krola, I'm just going to add on to that point a little bit from some of the research that we've been doing for our Hat Hat Palazzas Leila um, Sacred Cradle House program. Um, what we've learned, at least from the province of British Columbia, is, is about 50% um, of women under the age of 25 will become pregnant in their first year of being unhoused. Um, so particularly for our Indigenous women who, you know, are needing to access the hospital because that's the only care available to them, you know, there are those layers of, of stigma, right, around substance use, around being an Indigenous woman. And I know, you know, it's, it's very institutional, just, you know, speaking about our, our local services that are um, available. And for a lot of supportive housing programs, there aren't many that are family oriented and not many for 
uh, like BC Housing as an example, don't typically um, take people who are under the age of 19. Um, so there's a gap with, with that service there um, as well. And so I think, yeah, just the idea of having that soft landing place, even if it's just a, a temporary measure uh, to keep mom and babe together is, is so essential. We recognize that we, we work with an organization called Antis Within Reach, and it's a very grassroots um, organization of or, uh, birth workers. It started as birth workers and it's co uh, coaches, but that's um, they advocate for clients. They're present during births, um, and we work on case management with them, with our clients transitioning out, because we very much found the same thing. Um, that there needs to be somebody present and advocating previous to the to the birth, leading up to it, and then case planning after and advocating. And if that isn't present, then then often yes, there is apprehension. So we're we're in the baby stages of that, and again, learning from Nikan. And that is a a family program like Omamu Wangugamik um, is on our plan for a few years moving forward. And then uh, just to answer your second question, yes, like I think all of us are very much um, sharers of information. We tend to kind of be, uh, as our, our organization, we tend to kind of be the one helping in treatment. I'm actually up on the other side of the province right now. I've been there since July, opening up another treatment center with a nation. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we as an organization and myself and my peers here all value Helping, helping. Hi there, good morning. My name is Pam. Um, I'm from Regina, Saskatchewan, and I'm looking for the um, information on the Tawau um, per permanent supportive housing. I understand what the MAP program is that uh, managed alcohol program. What does the CAP stand for? Ca measured cannabis. Oh, okay. Measured alcohol and measured cannabis, again, looking at harm reduction. If somebody is on the streets and they're consuming uh, the hairspray or something along those lines, we want to try and transition them down, start them on a, a basically a higher content alcohol and work with them to transition down. Ideally, um, cannabis or marijuana is a least harm um, or, or the lesser of the two with um, as, as opposed to alcohol. So if we can transition them down to a combination of that or ultimately uh, cannabis in place of alcohol, then that's, that's, that's where we're headed. Next. Yeah, yeah. We've certainly um, been doing a lot of work and research around that as well. I just had a really quick question. I hope I, I may have missed it. Uh, I know you're data centered. Uh, what is the numbers of your homelessness population, respectively? So in Fort McMurray, we are sitting at, oh, that's contentious. That's a little contentious um, because our point of time counts have been a bit um, disrupted the last few years that we've done them. Um, but we know how many clients go through our doors and we're, we sit at around 107, I think 176 last year was what, what we went through with intake. So for the last 10 years, we sit at between 350 to 200, just under 200 on our accounts. No, um, so Indigenous would be 70, I believe it was 73% coming through centralized intake are of Indigenous ancestry. That's just reported. That's just Yeah, and that's why we say well, estimate on the chronic. Um, uh, again, I've done a bit of, I've pulled a lot of data in the last month and so, and I have all these, all these points in my head right now, but um, again, understanding that, looking at the data and understanding that experience. Um, I also saw that the, uh, there's a, a great difference in the youth demographic. So Indigenous youth is the, the fastest growing demographic. Um, in our community, 65% of uh, non-Indigenous are actually above the age of 40, 
where um, we only have one Indigenous person above the age of 65 that is on the BNL right now. Um, and then, <coughs> again, it, it's, it's almost like a total flip of ages. So uh, Indigenous is under the age of 45, I believe it is, so primarily. Um, yeah, thank you so much to both present. The, I really enjoyed both your presentation. Um, quick question on intersectionality, um, and it's for both. Um, what is your experience, and how do you um, include 2S LGBTQ folks um, in your spaces? Uh, so we we pride ourselves on being uh, very inclusive. Uh, organization we actually have quite a high staff number of from the LGBTQ community and because of that I think word of mouth has sort of spread that we we tend to be a very inclusive organization just by by I would say by organic nature and just really valuing um, diversity really valuing um, Yeah. 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 We don't um, sort of yeah. stand them out. They're just part of our relatives. We're all related. Yeah. And I don't know who you sleep with. Well, maybe. I can, I can say that I've been working. I've been working for 30 years, and I've been running that treatment center for over 11. And we've had many, many members of the LGBTQ community come through our programs, and. We've never had any serious issues with our clients even, how, how that has been. Um, we've, we've really just, I think just because it's a, it's a core value of, of, yeah, an indigenous worldview that it's, it's really never been a, a, a big concern or flagged as a big concern. We, uh, all of our staff go through training. Um, we try to be certified. Uh, try, I shouldn't try, say try. All of our staff go through training um, and we have been certified as like a safe space. And so. Can I, I can also add to that. So not very long ago, we had a two-spirit individual in our treatment program. Um, although they did, you know, we do have some gendered, uh, like where the bedroom space is. Um, they, they more so were exploring that identity while they were there. So although they were in that, I guess, gendered space, even though it's, you know, again, more part of our culture where that's not as much of a distinction, um, they were able to connect with elders and get teachings on Two-Spirit. Um, we've also had elders come in in like our cultural camps that give like a full, um, full days on like Two-Spirit and sexuality. Um, teachings from a cultured perspective. So although there is some, ge like, um, I guess, gendered spaces, they are encouraged that they can explore that and that they're still going to be safe and welcome. Um, and on our doors, we all have the little, you know, safe space. They can come and talk to us. And yeah, a lot of our staff are from that community so that they can find that support from somebody that they really uh, just yeah, quick note from from our experience as well. Our our work from the beginning has really been guided by learning about the family members that we serve, who they are, what nation do they come from, all of those intersectional components of our identity. And something we learned, we did a youth uh, knowledge gathering a couple years back because we're just getting our youth focused programming underway and. Um, 40% of the Indigenous youth that we serve who are either, you know, in care but living precariously and who are unhoused identify as part of the 2S LGBTQQIA community. So it's a real reality, a huge overrepresentation that we're seeing locally in Victoria, and I know the same is true across the country with about, I think it's one in three youth who identify as part of the queer community. So, you know, that really got our conversation started about where do we begin in this? And we started um, as a team actually out on the land. We held a number of sharing circles where staff had the opportunity to share what they know, share their own knowledge, the experience, you know, in everybody's life, um, we have we have someone in our life that we look to, that we learn from, and so that's really helped us in that policy development piece. Um, you know what's come through some of those conversations is con is continuing to hold those circles to do that learning. It is lifelong learning, 
and our elders have told us now, you know, we're looking to you because a lot of this, a lot of this knowledge and understanding has been lost with the, you know, imposition of residential schools and, and really taking time to reclaim that identity, what that looks like and, and in the housing sector. So, um, you know, for, for our programs, we are of course two spirit trans inclusive, um, but we definitely absolutely do need dedicated programming um, that support our, our Indigenous queer relatives as well to, to ensure that all spaces are safe and, and loving. We, um, with, our, with our support groups, and I'm, I'm it's, uh, yeah, there hasn't been that distinction. It's, it, it, I just, I think because we set that as a norm, it's, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> One more question. <laughs> Mine is a pretty big picture question. Um, so I am based out of Brandon, Manitoba. Um, I've worked street level and case management with both youth and adults for the past about five years. Um, our homelessness numbers have quadrupled um, since before COVID. Pre-COVID, we were at about maybe 150. Um, we're clocking in close to 500 to 600 at this point. And I'd say about 90% of our houseless population is Indigenous. Um, how do you navigate trying to implement programs like this um, when you are in a hub that is very colonial and very faith driven? <coughs> All of our youth services are Christian based. Our homeless shelter is Christian based. Um, we have next to no Indigenous representation in any level of government in our area. Something like this, we, we need it, we want it, but trying to get it, it's falling on deaf ears. How do you, how do you navigate that? <laughs> yes, please, please. No, I go, I go home honestly to the to the paw, and I really struggle with that. I like when I'm when I'm home, it's like, why is this happening? It's it's it, it really tears at my heartstrings. Um, there is change happening though, uh, and again, when I talk about like building those allies, try and try and have some conversations with your levels of government and talk. And again, arm yourself with data. Look at census data, pull everything that you can possibly pull and start piecing that together. Because if had, had I not had data to be able to come back and present to our chiefs and present to our levels of government, I wouldn't have gotten very far. Um, and, and a lot of doors were closed in my face um, because we, we are, we are the prairies as well, and I, t I absolutely understand where you're coming from, um, mm -hmm. and, and the frustration. Go, go talk to Wob. Yeah. <laughs> so we have tight data. Yeah. Um, I wish I had one when I was late, year with me. I think it's a lot of people that are running around somewhere. Um, but we do have a strong data system that we use in Brandon, but our city council, it doesn't matter how many numbers you throw on their face, we're a very reactive community as opposed to a proactive. <clears throat> we were worried about the opioid crisis years ago, and we just got 18 top beds in three years ago. Mm -hmm. So we're so far behind the curve. The only way you change people is one person at a time sometimes. And one way that I found highly effective when I was trying to, especially municipal or provincial government, is to actually ask them to come and sit in ceremony with me. And that resonates because it doesn't hit here. When you're in ceremony, you're going to feel it here and in your spirit. And that changes minds. Then all of a sudden they become awoke that, hey, there is something here and maybe I can listen now because there's still lots of Canadians that don't want to believe that all these residential schools had all these children buried, right? So one person at a time. Okay. Yeah. Allies, as much as you can. I want to give a, a thanks again. Let's, let's clap, clap by for
We woke her up. She was sleeping so peacefully. During, this is a, was an amazing presentation, and I'd like to reconnect with you about the conversation in, in Brandon. That's two hours from my territory. That's Ojibwe and Dakota territory. And my suggestion is to involve the the tribal nations that are in and around there. But I'd like to to be an ally in, in helping you in, in your municipality, as we've done some similar initiatives in Winnipeg that are indigenous led, and we just. These projects are paving the way like for uh, some re real impact 